Tina Koto Kato, Ko Topri Te Monga, Ko Waikato Te Awa, Ko Tainui Te Waka, Ko Nati Maputa Te Iwi, Te Matua o Toku Papa Mo Tainui, Me Te Uropi, uh, Te Taha Toku Mama Mo Uropi, I Fano Mai Aho Ki Paparo Te Tai Tokoro, I Tipu Mai Fa. Aho ki Beach Haven, ko Carol Neal toku ingoa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. So it seems only fitting, especially when we're uh, starting a family history chalk to, for me to declare who I am and where I'm from. And so my ancestry is very much... Uh, I think a very Pākehā New Zealand mixed with some um, tangata whenua as well, which I'm incredibly proud of. Uh, and um, I hope it also kind of sets the tone for thinking about um, our, my talk today. Uh, I do want to start with really sincerely apologising that Michael isn't here. Um, Michael has so much experience in thinking about history across New Zealand and in the work he's done over more decades than me. Um, so um, I really um, acknowledge his contribution to this talk as well. It is our thinking, not just my thinking. Um, and I also, before I forget, want to acknowledge that I have um, engaged with the wonderful Kura site in creating this, these slides. So a lot of the images that are showing on my slides here are from the Kura um, database, um, which I love. Um, I also just want to mention that my role currently at AUT, I did work at Massey, now I work at AUT, is in the School of Education, and that is where I'm teaching student teachers, um, which has been, which is just a wonderful combination of my interests um, in history and the history of education and how we do history in education, so I'll be drawing that in too. Yeah, so this talk represents a whole range of things that Michael and I have been doing together and separately over the last couple of years. So we've done a lot of work since the, um, the first announcement, particularly a very welcome announcement about the implications of learning Aotearoa histories in our schools, uh, which has come in this year. Uh, we also did some work in relation to that around a local history stop take, uh, a resources project um, on behalf of the Ministry of Education. Uh, we hold a uh, regular meeting of what we loosely call our family history network, and I acknowledge one of our friends here, Hazel um, Petrie, with us um, so it's really nice to see one of our one of our small but um, interesting network here. Um, also, talk um, in terms of work um, with and supervision of postgraduate students in history at Massey University, uh, which I'm fortunate to continue the relationship with, even though I don't work there, uh, that Michael leads, and also some of the ideas that have come around our own family history research. And also, therefore, for me, I will be infusing um, some reflections on the work that I do with student primary teachers. And if we get a chance later on to talk about that could be interesting, because it's awfully interesting to teach people history who have not necessarily chosen to, you know, uh, because that it's an obligation as a teacher, as opposed to something that they've been drawn to and passionate about. Uh, so this presentation is really building some thinking out loud that Michael and I have done together and separately over the last few months uh, over so, has some of these projects have been completed and to and to reflect on our work and it's sort of seemed a, a great opportunity to be able to come to this talk in Family History Month to sort of think about these ideas about the relationship between local and family history. So to start with the history's curriculum, really, at, at the basis of where I'm coming from, 
the history's curriculum as what is meant to be a localised curriculum has at the foundation of it really this idea of local history and engaging with it. But it's also based very much on the idea of place-based learning that has particularly uh, resonated with Māori scholars like Wally Penatito. So essentially the questions are, you know, ko wai o, kei hia o, who am I, where am I? And it, it's really around exploring who we are and how we fit in relation to place. Wally Penatito argues that this essentially brings politics of identity and politics of location together in a way that children can see themselves and can experience their sense of identity and belonging in the curriculum in a way that has that counters what has been a lot of intergenerational marginalization in in the histories and in our in our education system and the reason why i bring this up now is because to a large extent i think the who am i question can often first of all represents more of a sociological or anthropological or social history question whereas the where am I tends to be more geography focused, but also very much around local history. So this sort of thing has been a space where I've really been thinking about the intersection between family history and local history. It's no coincidence that Māori history is extremely important in the history's curriculum, and this really evidences, I think, how history has changed over the past couple of decades, especially. Essentially, we can think about whakapapa being completely immersed with local history and vice versa. Māori writers like Nipi and Mahuka remind us that whakapapa and genealogy are not the same thing, even though they kind of get loosely translated in that way, but that Māori whakapapa is everything. It is a worldview. But as Michael has often discussed from his own research with the Waitangi Tribunal, whakapapa came to be sort of formalised into law, uh, particularly through the Māori land courts. So through the 19th century, this, this sort of kind of... Um, hard to describe how I'm thinking of it, a kind of fluid understanding around local history and whakapapa really uh, emerged, at least from a Pākehā point of view, while at the same time some Western traditions of thinking and building and institutionalising uh, hist history um, came into being. So in particular, I think the assertion of Māori and, the, and Māori control over whakipapa and pepeha has been a really important assertion of rights and place as tangata whenua. And so while similar in terms of genealogy, it is expressed very differently in mean, and, and made meaning of in purpose. So an important thing to acknowledge is that local Māori history has come to be very much in the public domain, particularly through the Waitangi claims process and settlements process and that process also has really contributed a lot to the professional you know uh, professional historian sector across this country and that respect and support for Māori writing Māori history is has been a really another really important development and that is one reason why I have the image there of the Po Whenua um, that is in Marlborough of the Rangitani chief Ihaya Kaikura. Peter Mayhana, who is another colleague that I've really had the privilege of working with, who is Rangitani, uh, he and his cousin, Liana MacDonald, have done a lot of work around building knowledge and respect of local mana whenua history in the Marlborough region and particularly with the schools in those regions. So there's been some real um, really interesting stuff that has come out of their work around linking people and lineage and family with place. And so one of the things that Peter Mayhana wrote when he uh, actually wrote a chapter around the local history of Palmerston North with our Massey colleagues, which has been really interesting, is that Māori history is shaped by migration, first from Hawaiiki and then within Aotearoa. It is organised around whakapapa, which helps frame identity, and identity is inherently linked to land and mana 
and so on the one hand, that's there a really important acknowledgement for me to understanding and thinking about Māori history in, when we think about local and family history. But it's also to acknowledge that in the development of our colonial settler society, local and family history have sometimes gone together and sometimes diverged. So the relationship is really um, is harder to really understand. And that's kind of why I'm here today, to provoke some thinking about it. Not necessarily promising any answers, but that's a spoiler alert. Um, so first of all, I really want to just sort of refer back to the relationship between academic history, local history, and family history. Referring back to place-based learning, the idea of integrating identity and belonging is really helpful. And in essence, it sets down a strong argument for working in collaboration between history-interested people and communities. But we need to acknowledge that the reality has been that there has been a certain amount of siloing between, of academic history from local history and from family history, as Shona alluded to before, around some of the challenges of sort of how people think about family versus local history. So today, these things have, we can acknowledge that there's been a history that means that they are looked at quite separately, and I want to explore some things around that. Um, Communities have tended to form around academic history, local history, and family history. And on the one hand, we've seen that as quite fascinating, and on the other hand, quite unhelpful in reality. And, and I, I wonder, um, even um, for you who are here and listening today, um, whether you think of yourselves in a particular camp or across camps, um, because that's often what we observe people do. Maybe we can talk about that later. Um, first of all, I just really want to make some distinctions between academic um, history and sort of uh, often what is called amateur history or perhaps more of a personal endeavour of history. And what's really happened in reality is that academic and professional history have, have grown up like our universities in a very, very Western systems of thinking and knowledge creation that has particularly lent itself to disciplinary specialization. So academic history is very much grown with the idea of using evidence to support interpretation and that the idea of rigor that's sort of at the heart of academic history really comes from sort of enlightenment thinking from Europe. Um, and Western interpretations of science and therefore the meanings that are made or seen to be valid. So academic history, I think for a long time, we could argue has been dominated by sort of a national level view of history. And I have to admit, if you listen closely to my background, looking at New Zealand's trade policy history, et cetera, that was kind of my background too. Um, and that first of all would would really have come, first of all, because of the use of official sources that were government sources, largely from central government um, sources, et cetera. So for some time, local history has been, you know, we might say the poorer cousin or the, the more neglected sibling academically, or at least not as academically popular as national stories, which have often... Um, had an early focus on the development uh, of the settler colony, the farming economy, and nationalised efforts in war and society building. But academics certainly do do local history, and Russell Stone, um, particularly for Auckland, I think, has been extremely important um, in that respect. But local history research, would say, has tended to be less common, or less common in terms of those published works that we have, at least. I would say that local history tends to have a much wider range of creators, of evidence used, and therefore also of interpretation and ways of being published and shared. And family history, I would say, is even greater, um, but we'll get to that more. So family histories, though, uh, and I find this really interesting, um, often aren't published 
or if they are, they are often self-published. So that kind of speaks to uh, the, the marketing priorities of public of publishing houses. Um, so I think that's really interesting if we kind of think about the research to publication ratio, so to speak, the research activity versus how much is published out in in this kind of nice way of the example of the Rowe family history, um, then it would be well behind national history, uh, local history, which is well behind national history. So I just want to talk a little bit about how we've kind of, we have kind of discussed local history over time in terms of how that's developed. So Little Dean was published in 1938 and is an example really of sociology starting to mix with history um, by uh, Crawford Somerset and in education history. I always think more about his wife, Gwen Somerset, who was um, so important in writing about and, and working with the play centre movement. Um, in 1957, uh, W.J. Gardner, Jim Gardner, a, was a real proponent of local history with his 1950s work, Amuri, a county history that he'd written a year earlier. And in 1957, he wrote a piece in Landfall that really um, expressed great enthusiasm, not so much that he was writing himself in it or that he had something particularly important to say, but the fact that Landfall had asked him to write about local history, that it was actually being included and therefore recognised. So he said, local history may not have arrived, but it is on its way. Another example um, in 1971 was Bill Oliver's regional study of the East Coast. And I'd say this is an example more of a geography-based approach into local history that is emblematic of developments in regional studies at that time. It was important in, in that it worked to show the distinctiveness of the East Coast region in relation to the wider national understandings of national development, etc. From the 1960s, um, the availability of computers fledgling in 1960s, much greater later on. But those sort of tools of social research dramatically increased the capability of historians to say things about large numbers of groups of people. So large scale studies based on censuses, returns, street directories, bastimal records, conscription, enlistment data, et cetera, provided if they were found and were fed um, sometimes indiscriminately into large and then small computers to explain patterns of social life. So that was where social history really started to come in with an emphasis on sort of the lives of common people, so to speak. People that weren't necessarily the leaders that we might find more in local histories or the people who were seen to be really influential in the development of a locality, but essentially really trying to understand those people who don't hit the headlines or only do when they do extraordinary things. Um, so those histories uh, started to become more adventurous with their methods and using a really vast range of sources. So in the 1990s, Eric Olson was a leader of the development of the Cavisham Project out of the University of Otago. And that was really seen to be quite groundbreaking in terms of using large scale evidence and sources to really um, try to explore the complexities of social life, etc. Local history research grew, sort of had had started to grow in the 80s, and this was an, an example of where it was sort of coming to more prominence in terms of funding and support for it uh, academically. And uh, Jim Gardner um, responded to. Eric Olson in the late 1990s talking about how he was seeing local history fitting within wider history um, by that time. And he really noted how things had changed and how to his mind that local focus was necessary because as he said, most people lived out their lives in 
local environments and thought of themselves in local or provincial terms. So that local history was able to really develop a consciousness, a, a sort of become more sociologically informed and alert to a new cultural history that offered a new perspective on how things were. So then later we have the Auckland History Initiative, which has been running for a few years now, um, and it's brought some really interesting work. And I believe, Hazel, your work uh, sits within that broad thing too. I think one of the things too is this sort of idea of more collective work by historians, you know, the project-based work, which has been on the one hand a necessity for funding, um, but on the other hand represents a... a, a, a more creative way of historians working together. So um, I want to use an example that's come out of that, of Lucy McIntosh's work, Shifting Grounds. Um, I think this is a beautiful book uh, and it's really um, a thoughtful local history that really does invite the reader, like I did, to you know just wanna go and walk in those areas and really engage with the history in a way that you could start to see. So. Um, yeah, I found that um, to be sort of right on time also for this thinking that we're doing around education and local history that we're wanting our young people to do. So despite my points about family history tending to be less published, we have had some really interesting examples of family history published in more recent years, and here's some examples. Um, also in our family history network, we have um, some who are engaging more explicitly with the idea of critical, critical family history that is more of a sociological approach. Uh, and Richard Shaw's, um, the book, the middle book there, is a really good example of that. So it, I find these books really interesting to really interrogate family histories and family stories in ways that explore the dynamics of communities, of our, our national um, culture and society. Also that they challenge the country's colonial history and the politics of privilege and discrimination. So they are really great models of what is possible with family history and how it can intersect with academic history, but also, more importantly, be popular with a wider public audience. So, also though, we have seen academic histories really incorporating genealogy genealogical methods. Um, so whereas family history has tended to be regarded as this more amateur endeavor that was not taken seriously, we're actually finding that there are historians uh, and prominent ones who are really acknowledging that um, family history and those methods and the information that come from them are super important. We often have historians acknowledge their bias sometimes about family historians being in archives and being more chattery or less serious in what they're doing. Um, and I think that attitude has, has come to change. And I think one of the things that we need to recognize, particularly at a time where history among other disciplines in universities is under threat. Um, and so actually acknowledging that uh, family historians and local historians who use the archives, who use wonderful facilities like this, are to a large extent holding up those institutions that we so desperately need as academics as well. So there's some real, um, there is some real symbiosis there. So, as libraries and archives have increasingly become used to providing for the needs of family historians, we think they have, you have, earned the rightful place in a increasingly diverse sort of um, area um, and way of interpreting the past that can really help each other, we hope. So the examples of the histories here that we have are, for example, Rollo Arnold's 
the farthest land, which focused on English-assisted migrants from rural England in the 1870s. Uh, so that was under a general government scheme and was made possible by the abolition of the provinces at the time. So some quite detailed work there that, that built an understanding of those English-assisted migrants in the 1870s. Charlotte MacDonald's A Woman of Good Character examined single woman assisted migrants in the 19th century as well, and really opened up an understanding of those assisted migrant schemes and the, the sort of the working people that were, were coming to New Zealand, and particularly single women in that respect, mainly to uh, Canterbury and to Otago. And Jock Phillips and Terry Hearn's book, Settlers here um, in 2008. So Charlotte's was in uh, 1990, I believe. So theirs was able to really take advantage of technological advances um, and use more widely digital sources to provide a much more nuanced understanding of English, Irish and Scottish settlers and the distinctions between them, which I think has become a really important level of understanding in, in history um, today. So while Charlotte MacDonald's book could be seen as more situated regionally or locally, the other two tend to, to use those genealogical methods more to understand some, some national stories, so to speak. So now I just want to talk a little bit about some of the work that our postgraduate students have been doing um, that have also sought to use family history methods, but have also, I think, helped to, to provide some deeper local history understanding as well. So the first is Sue McCliskey. She has been doing a PhD looking at uh, Nelson settlers that came in the Wakefield scheme in the 1840s. She's done some really interesting with a huge database tracking of individuals and their families and found that for one thing, migrants didn't necessarily come and settle. You know, we so often talk about migrants and settlers as, as the same thing. But what she has really found is that a lot of people moved from Nelson and a lot of people went overseas, and some of this was connected to the gold rushes, and some of it was other reasons. But I think that she has, has been a really important thing that she has found is how family connections have been really influential in what people decided to do or whether they decided to stay, or family circumstances affected how people, what people did next and where they, where they were, et cetera. And she sees those networks as across empire, uh, across from New Zealand to Australia, and also um, to, to America. Reed Wheeler has been looking at the Albert Landers settlement uh, and really exploring the archives available to uh, on the settlers. And that um, has been um, close to my heart, given that my mother grew up in Kaiwaka and her um, her grandparents actually came to live in Port Albert, even though they weren't Albert Landers. So that kind of is another interesting example of how we kind of through family can get a bit more of an, an understanding of, of what happened and who was there. But Reed's work has been um, really interesting in considering the differences between the plans that were made and the expectations that people had in signing up to be Albert Landers and actually what happened when they came to New Zealand, um, including um, those who never actually got to Port Albert. And Anne-Marie Quinn has done a really interesting piece of work on nurse entre entrepreneurs. She used a lot of genealogy and family history sources to track nurse entrepreneurs, those uh, women who particularly opened up and ran private hospitals. So that seems a little bit disconnected maybe, but what I found from working with Anne-Marie was that there were some really interesting things that came out that gave you a sense of what, was, what it was like in local areas where those hospitals were being um, were being built and, and where women were, were trying to get their certification for them. So for example, 
I think it was in Pyro, but I could be wrong. Um, she was talking about how in the early 1900s, one nurse was having terrible trouble trying to get the um, sewage system organised for the hospital. Now, this doesn't seem um, perhaps terribly interesting, but what it is, is it gives you a real sense of, oh, this is what was happening in the community at the time, where, where um, the, the issues of infrastructure development, et cetera. So a lot of what she found in those stories, particularly where women were working uh, and sort of um, very much engaged with community dynamics at, as well as the community medical needs. So one of the things that I hope I can show with those three is that really local history and family history are, can be very much intertwined, but it does tend to depend on how long a family stays in a particular place. Uh, recently, I visited Tauranga Library and had a great time talking to a group on their family history night, night. And I was really fascinated, but not necessarily surprised when I asked the audience, you know, who here um, is the first generation or the second or third or fourth generation to live in this area, um, that most were first generation. So that sort of implies that, you you know, they were obviously interested in local history, or they seemed to be when they were talking to me. Um, they were also interested in family history, but it did not necessarily mean that their family history, particularly for Pākehā people, was uh, fixed with place. So I think that's really interesting to think about because we do have quite a mobile population um, here in, in New Zealand. So a couple of observations at this point about academic history, local history, and family history. We have to admit that these have tended to grow up alongside each other, but not necessarily closely, a bit like competitive siblings, or maybe cousins whose parents don't get along. Or if we look at popular publications and formal outputs, we do have to acknowledge that there's been a hierarchy. Uh, but we also need to recognise that this is changing, and in our opinion, it should. That while academic historical knowledge is useful and can often make meaning of big picture uh, patterns that can help us make sense of these more localised or family um, events and histories, uh, that they do need to be speaking to each other. Um, another really important point that I want to move to is about motivation to engage in history. Academic and professional historians do this as paid work, largely, uh, which is an enormous privilege. But it also comes with socialisation into the discipline, expectations of outputs, publications, a certain element of competition, as much as we don't like to admit it, particularly for funding and how our work is shared and received. So, so far I've talked mainly about uh, history as a, as a kind of professional endeavour, but I want to move now to history more as a personal endeavour. And that really, I think, we can, we can all acknowledge that there has been a recent democratisation or greater accessibility uh, and, um, and recruitment, so to speak, of people into history. The significant technological changes that have taken place that not only benefit us as academics and professional historians, but really anyone. And I think we can all acknowledge that papers past has changed my life <laughs> and possibly many, many of us. Um, the accessibility to so many resources that help with family and local history has been quite extraordinary when we step, step back and look at it. Um, it's amazing to see how libraries have um, developed archives and, and as I've mentioned, Kura is something I quite often get lost in and certainly so do my students who use it regularly. So the expansion of, of the doing of history is a source of real interest to us and I think this is an area that academics have kind of not taken so much notice of for quite a while and we now see that now we've got these expectations around history being engaged with more in communities through schools, through school children, that this should spread out. So we need to think about that. It's really fascinating to think about how social history is shared through social media. Facebook pages sharing history are fascinating. Um, 
so there's yet for some quite new and innovative ways of history being shared and engaged with in those more traditional publications we've looked at earlier. And I suppose the other point I would make at this point about technology, and et cetera, is that family history, even before technology, but possibly worse now, is never ending, right? It's quite hard to get to a point where you go, okay, I can publish a book now because something else keeps um, coming up. And I think the other thing that is really interesting about that is that because so many people are doing this as a personal endeavour that is often perhaps like a piece of craft that we pick up at times and do a lot on and then we put down and sometimes a new piece of evidence or something will bring it again. So it's more like quilt making than kind of book writing. That's my thoughts. It'll be interesting to see what you think. The other thing is around communities have developed, and this has been going on obviously for a while. We had uh, Heritage New Zealand established through an act of parliament in 1954. Um, and that was really spurred on, I think, by the success of the centennial celebrations in 1940, more of a sense of a more independent New Zealand after World War II. So in effect, we really, um, this sort of idea of a coming of age being represented representing an ongoing commitment to preserving the country's history. But historical societies had already formed, but became more of a, a federation, the New Zealand History Federation from 1871. Uh, and I think they have been a really interesting and important coordinating space for the local history societies. And then, of course, we have the genealogy networks and groups for family history, uh, particularly through the um, establishment of the New Zealand Society of Genealogists, which I believe was also in the 1970s. I haven't here. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and I haven't, I haven't put there, but I do really need to acknowledge also the Oral History Association, No Hands, because they often cross over so much uh, in terms of family history. And I actually really find Anna Green's work into collective memory a really useful thing for thinking about how we develop family history and, and, and in fact, how we engage with history full stop. So one thing that we don't understand so much is the membership of these groups. We've come to understand that they play a really important role, but we're not really sure so much of the overlaps, and perhaps those of you who are more um, in them they do understand that, but we sort of feel like that's a really important thing to know in order to know how to engage as well. Um, we've come to really appreciate how strong many of these groups are, but not really, and, and particularly how the different publications that are created from these groups are really important for public engagement with local and family history as well. Some work that we did, the Resources Stock Take project, took us mainly focused to local museums around the country. So we surveyed all the museums and we visited 130 of them between four of us. Uh, and we came to really appreciate some important things. Um, these are just some examples of those that we went to. First of all, that each museum presented a quite distinctive history of the local area. And secondly, that those museums often had real riches in their archives that went far beyond what we saw as kind of the collections on display. So we came to appreciate really how much fam local family archives were being held in museums and how important they were therefore for family historians too, so for family history engagement in the local community. Um, the really important thing also we found was such a significant amount of volunteer labour that goes into supporting these museums, many running only on volunteer labours, and most of those people in all reality being retirement age people, and not recently retired. Some of these uh, people who were the great holders of knowledge and that working really hard were well in their 80s and into their 90s. So a lot of be is being asked of these volunteer groups where local history resources is concerned. And that's something that, that we want to think about. And, and Liz Ward, who was another member of our team there, and I, who is now the Marlborough uh, Museum 
manager, uh, we are doing some work to better understand that that landscape really of museum volunteers, their motivations, their activities, because they are holding a really important responsibility in terms of how local history is engaged with. So another thing there is really trying to understand the motivations and towards and meaning from history that people, uh, why people engage with history. And this relates to a, to a small study that we did with some history students in secondary schools early on. Um, we were wanting to ask them why they chose history and um, what they liked most about it. And we asked a, a question to them about whether they felt that in doing history it was about them, learning about themselves and their families or whether it was about others. And we were surprised that to a large extent, it, these students were saying it's about learning about others. And this kind of correlated with the types of subjects that they were doing, which was mainly about war and conflict, international New Zealand's engagement in international wars, not much about the New Zealand wars. It was also uh, in terms of engagement about um, probably at most um, not away from war was sort of civil rights. So there was often this sort of interest um, that was expressed. And this was what we, when we talked to the teachers, was something that they were saying that they were offering to students because students were showing a real interest in history in terms of the more dramatic uh, or the more um, sensational types of, of history that you get in studying war, uh, et cetera. So that was really interesting to us to think about um, where we got a real ambivalence, where even when we asked them about the importance of learning New Zealand history, um, to a large extent, they said it's important, but we need to know other histories as well. So if, if we're going to be thinking about what we really want to, um, want, want, if we want students to love history, um, then we really want to need to think about how we capture their hearts as well as their minds with that. So that really takes me to a point about family history. And even though it has tended to um, enjoy less publication, mm -hmm. it has certainly enjoyed more popularity through the media, like the TV shows, like Who Do You Think You Are and, and the others that we see. Um, so it's interesting to me that family history, while not being so published, is also really enjoys more press in, in public entertainment so to speak. And I and when we even think about the New Zealand-based uh, shows like Who Do you, uh, Passengers and New David Lomax Investigates, it's, it's interesting to try and think about how much this is trying to capture a, a younger market or perhaps even try to work in ways like, you know how with the entertainment that we've had over the Football World Cup, this idea of recruitment, people get excited and want to try try football, then then we've got something of a similar idea in terms of this idea of media uh, portraying family history, both as entertainment, but also potentially drawing people in to want to do it for themselves. So, Jim Gardner uh, reflected on the relationship between local and national national academic history in the late 1990s, as I mentioned right at the beginning, and he came to the conclusion that he he'd never really figure it out or, or at least be able to figure out, you know, define exactly that relationship. And I've got to admit that while I try to think about uh, the relationship between local and family history, it gets very muddy. It's not cut and dried. And even though we can see that a legacy of different ways of thinking that have shaped local versus family history, particularly as we've become a society that is much more comfortable in acknowledging and incorporating Māori history and indeed have such a mix of histories between our very diverse population today, then perhaps the distinctions won't matter too much at all, but as long as they can be equally valued. So just as family histories can be complicated, so too is this relationship. But we do need to seriously think about how we're relating 
across the different disciplines. If history is to become more of a public endeavour, and that's what we hope it will with the history's curriculum, then we need to find a way to support our local history institutions and the people who are really um, running that. So I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be distinctions, just like all members of the family, we all want to be valued. But we also should be able to work to our strengths but be supported to do that. So we should be better communicating. And that's essentially the reason why we wanted to engage today, because we want to be able to listen and to also be able to offer support where we can. So thank you for listening today, and I hope this is part of an ongoing conversation. Kia ora.